Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeanette. Alcoholic. Hi, and I am sober today because of God and sponsorship. My sobriety date is August 28th of 1988. And for that, I literally owe you my life. Um, it was funny when we prayed before the meeting, I have to admit, I go, God, how did he know about that? Um, cause I am, I am so wicked full of myself. I can't see straight sometimes. So thanks <laughs> for that. Um, I, uh, I always pray and ask God to use me as an instrument of his mercy, his peace and of his will, um, to just speak in me and through me, you know, because I know with that, I will be okay. Um, just having so the desire, you know, I don't need much more than else. Um, everything else comes out of my experience, of course. And, um, sorry, I was a bit tardy. I, of course, was in the bathroom on my knees because that's where I'm more comfortable in prayer. But I love the power of, of the group and, and knowing that we're all united because I'll tell you what, I was as completely disconnected from the human race as you could possibly get. I got to assure you, Rachel, that half the guys in this group did not get here looking this good. And I really, <laughs> and I don't know that because I'm only living here for like six weeks, but I promise you, um, I come from a group of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, where, uh, serious group pride. I got sober in Helena, Montana and it's in the book group. And, um, I watched the men come bright, shiny and happy, you know, from a distance, they were resembling men. And then as, as time went on, they really became men. And it's the same as with the ladies, you know, my sponsor said, if you don't want to be treated like a hooker, don't dress like one. Um, and I, Oh, oh. <laughs> is that how that happens? <laughs> you know, which is funny because she's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin right now, um, at a job thing and second in command, my uh, bestest friend, Teresa, uh, I called her, she's in Minnesota and, uh, I called her and it's like the neckline hemline and <laughs> making sure it's not all, you know, the same line. Um, and, and, um, being able to be presentable and, and accountable and responsible in my life, which are words that I can't spell, let alone be able to muster, uh, what they mean in my life today. I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, um, through, uh, no fault of my own. Now I, I got here in, I, I guess I, I, my first meeting was the spring of 1988. And what had been going on for me is about that time, it was about the year anniversary of a boy that I was completely obsessed with and in a very tumultuous, I mean, insane. You, I really think we could have been, you know, Bonnie and Clyde, teenage Bonnie and Clyde, of course, because I was 15 and he was 16. Um, he committed suicide. March 16th of 1987 shattered my world. My parents took me to California because, um, they knew I was next and, um, tried to get me a change of scenery, kind of bring me back to health, so to speak. And it was come about the year of that anniversary and I was running out of doors. I mean, I have been in a spin cycle since I'm 10 years old. My mother started taking me to a psychiatrist at that time. My father's a Vietnam vet. And, um, I'm, I was raised Catholic, so I have four brothers and I have one sister and, um, I have, you know, a sister, brother, myself, and then three boys. My sister was so much older than me that it was just pandemonium chaos. I mean, I got these big football playing, fast car driving brothers, and then there's me. And my mom is like so crazy with my dad. They just don't know what to do with me. So they started taking me to the doctor. What is wrong with her? You know, because I'm at the breakfast table at 830 in the morning, and I can't breathe in and out. You know, I am ready to punch my little brother because he's crunching his Captain Crunch, you know, and the kid just wants to go to second grade, you know, <laughs> and I am on. On edge. I can't stand it anymore. So they're taking me to the doctor and, you know, what is your pro- Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 310. I went and I cannot tell you today with such gratitude that there was not the pharmaceuticals out there today. I just don't know how, how else to say it. They did not sedate me. They didn't save me from myself, you know, although I really needed saving for myself. They just smiled and nodded. And, and would, you know, try to give me some potential power positive points for my life of what I could do to be a better person, you know, which I can't muster that. I can't hear that. You're telling me to do something. I don't understand what you're saying. Come out of your mouth. Don't punch your little brother. What? You know, that doesn't, it just happens. I don't think about it. I just do it. Um, don't start fires. That would be another place to start. <laughs> don't steal cars. <laughs> I like stealing cars. I'm good at it. And if God wouldn't want me to, he wouldn't give me the know-how was uh, my big battle cry. 
So what happened for me is I discovered um, at a real early age I was empty and angry inside. And I don't know why. I mean, have all the crazy chaos and, you know, all the stuff that, you know, should look like um, why I should drink. But I, you know, I just, Eureka. I just got to drink. I took a drink, and I am not kidding you. I was John Wayne and Marilyn Monroe. You know, I loved it. It was awesome. It was like the first full deep breath I could finally take. You know, this anvil sitting on my chest my whole life. And, oh, God, get me some. And we got after it. I, um, unfortunately, was a, a minor child. <laughs> and so you got to work a little hard to get that stuff. And, and, uh, if you've had to try to be a drunken babysitter at the age of 12, um, it doesn't come easy. You know, I mean, I am, um, I, I kind of had the, the scroungy mangy, um, woman down the street that I babysat for cause she paid me in a 12 pack. And if she came home at three 30, I got a quarter bag. And if she was gone until six and I did the dishes, she'd pay me 23 50, which we know in 1985 math was a uh, two fifths. And I'd pray, oh, God, please don't let her come home till morning. Please don't let her come home till morning because that's two fifths. And I need two for me. And if you have any, you'll share because I need to be drunk. You know, I'm always, I was always the kid who was figured out higher math is not my forte, but I can figure out what, you know, California color, Strohs, praise God. Do you remember when Strohs came out in 15 packs? They were thinking. They finally figured it out. And now they're, I remember when my husband was drinking, I'd get 30 packs. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, you know, they know, they understand. What is <laughs> What is six? What, that's waste my time, you know. To this day, and I'll tell you what, I finally have to tell myself, a, a world, uh, life-changing event has happened to me. For a very long time, I used to say that, you know what, I've never had an umbrella in my drink. I am not a mixing kind of girl. I don't want a pink drink, okay? I am straight up nothing back. I, I don't have the time, okay, to mix, to blend, to add olives and crap, okay? Skip it. Um, like John says, do and keep them coming. Um, he is my, my soul father, in a sense. Um, I went out to dinner the other night and asked, you know, everybody was eating, and I don't, I wasn't eating at, you know, 1030 was after Sherman Fox Hall. And I said, you know, you got some skim milk and some strawberries. Could you just blend that up for me, you know, and hold the whatever you put in it to make a margarita? I don't know, because I always drink it straight. And sure enough, it comes with an umbrella. And it occurred to me, you could put your eye out with one of these things, you know? This is like a lethal weapon because I just have to get it in me fast so I can have freedom and some peace of mind, and you will get off my back and leave me alone because back up, you know, you're a little closer. You're invading my personal space. And um, I walked down the halls of hell in a high, you know, like um, – possessed by the devil. I just can't think. I really, true true to my experience, I'll tell you that um, drugs play a very important part. Um, I started growing dope before I ever took a drink, um, but out of respect for AA and I'm standing here in this meeting, I'll just tell you that um, it, it not only accelerated and enhanced, but it amplified my drinking because it was a lot easier to control and to hide and to get than it was a drink. I mean, I can remember... <laughs> this awesome guy, Rob, who was dating my friend Shelly, I'd say, Rob, and I'd be peeling off the ones, okay, this is what I want you to get me. And, the, you know, Olympia, 24 ounces were on sale, or 24-pack, 11-ounce bottles were on sale, four ninety nine at Candy Market. I want two of those, and I need a bottle of Mad Dog. And I'm like, listen, listen, I'm like peeling off all this money for him, and I'm like stash it in the bushes behind my house. And I can remember 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock that night thinking, dude, he took off with my money, and I was going to bust his headlights out. I was ready to kill him, you know, and then finally headlights in the alley. And already I feel better, you know, and running down the stairs and running out to the lilac bushes and grabbing it, running up the stairs and stashing it in my closet. And and I am the I am the... Uh, alcoholic drug addict, so to speak, that would cut open my mattress and shove stuff in there, twist off the knobs on my bed, stick it down in there. And then when the paranoia hits, I'm rushing all over my room because I know there's something somewhere. And I was always contained. But um, Everclear's my first choice, um, but I'll take whatever you have if you're sharing. You know, I mean, it's just the way I am. Um, so I started getting in trouble right away. I don't have um, a slow dance with this uh, alcoholism thing. And as it is in my life today is the fact that um, I am just in no danger of hitting the front page of the paper for any kind of crime of any sort. And that was pretty much my only calling card in high school. Is that's, She's going to be the one to go to prison. <laughs> she's going to, because that was already happening. I mean, I'm 13 years old and I'm getting locked up and I'm coming to you and I'm covered in blood and I'm like, all right, I'm not bleeding. 
it's not my blood because that's the first panic, you know. And then I'm getting released to my mother at 4.30 in the morning. And my mom is this tiny little petite Native American woman who wouldn't say boo if you stabbed her in the eye with a fork. You know, she's just that kind of woman. How she got me, I do not know. But looking at her face and... I can remember, you know, times as a little kid disappointing her and, you know, being mean to my little brothers and things like that. But whenever that one would have to come to get me out of jail or whenever the cops would bring me home and I'd be standing on the porch and they'd be going, nah, 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 nah. you know, I would just look at my mom and she would just have this pain. And it wasn't just the disgust or remorse or anything. It just that hurt. And I saw that look a lot on my mother's face largely in part due to me and my actions. But it's not enough for me. It's not enough for me to think that I'm breaking my mother's heart or that she's laying in bed crying or that she's worried about me in a ditch. I mean, I have to completely be such a selfish... You know, my friend Frank says it best. He says that when I drank, I drank like a pig. And when I was sober, I acted like a pig. Drunk or sober, without a spiritual path, I'm a monster. Basically, I am. You know, I'm a not nice girl. I am the girl your mother warned you about. Because... Later in my drinking, my mom was warning, you know, warning you about me. Carmen, if you go out with Jeanette tonight, don't you dare blame it on her. Because you're getting in that car on your own free will. And she'd call Carmen's mom, Debbie, Carmen's with Jeanette. And I don't want to hear about it. Click. Because I was always, don't hang around with that Jeanette. She's going to get you in trouble. And all my friends were like, well, that's why we like Jeanette. <laughs> you know, that's why we want to go. Because she's crazy. Did you know she did a fire dance on Friday night? You know, because that was my calling. I would get drunk climb into the bonfire at the keg and start dancing. Come to my coat singed. The back of my hair smells like skunk. And I, I don't know what would happen. Was it a good time? Did you have fun? Okay, let's do it again. Because I, I, I don't know what else to do with myself. And Wednesday night, I'm thinking, okay, it's almost Thursday. It's almost Thursday because it's Thirsty Thursday. And all the senior boys would get us drunk, of course, because I know what the boys want. Me drunk Nick in the fire. Right? Doing my Native American dance. No. You know, they just think, oh, my God, this girl's crazy. Someone save her for herself. And that is what, true to, my, <laughs> true to my experience, I have to tell you something. I am not a commitment queen. The fact that I am sober here, as long as I am sober, I am in a marriage with one man, the same man, for like a really long time now that's astonishing. And I have the same sponsor for many, many years. Blows my mind. I am not a keep coming back kind of person. I am not. I am the queen of the one night stands. Okay. I don't want a commitment. I just want to borrow him. Get over yourself. It's convenient. He's here. I'm here. Whatever. All right. He's a big boy. And so that was the thing. And I, I promise you, your husbands are safe today. And as men, you're safe today um, because my husband is safe today. And that's where it began. It began with, you know, my sponsor saying, you know, one good, what, how to replace that bad day of history is one day of good history. And that's what I've done, you know, consistently and persistently in my, in my life is I've become my worst nightmare. I stand here in front of you and I, I look like a Republican's wife. I could be the governor of California's wife. I mean, this is not. I got to Alcoholics Anonymous in 1988 with a mohawk. It was hot pink and blonde, and I had a Metallica metal up your ass shirt on, and I had a pair of jeans <laughs> that were shredded, shredded jeans. Certain parts of the anatomy were shown, of course, for effect. And I was, my sponsor said <laughs> that I looked like a porcupine, and I'll tell you what I felt like a porcupine, because at that time in my life, I'm already through, you know, five, six years of um, counseling. I've already done treatment twice. Um, I've already, you know, what haven't I done? I've cleared my shockers. I've had chance. I've done, you know, seances and sweats and everything to figure out what is my problem? Why can't I sleep at night? Why can't I sit still? How come I can't breathe now? Even that I'm drunk, even that I'm drunk and I'm hallucinating now. What is wrong with me? I don't get it. And I promise you, a future member of Alcoholics Anonymous? No, 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 no. Long time. Um, contented sobriety, not my forte, you know, because when that woman told me to sit in the front row to get a big book and to be on time and, you know, Jeanette, you may want to put some clothes on. I was like, get over it, lady. You're just jealous because you're old. You know, that's that's all I could think is, you know, man, 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 man. God have mercy. I often say in self-defense for my sponsor, I called her one time and said, <laughs> 
whatever the recent thing was. Yeah, it'll pass. You know, Ronnie, I just want to tell you, be glad you got a job slick. I mean, you know, and, and if it's that, that's the problem that you may not be, there's another one right around the corner. I mean, there's never anything um, that somebody in this room hasn't gone through, um, won't be going through, or that they know somebody who knows somebody that's going through it, you know, and they got through it sober and it was okay. And that's what enriches our lives is this experience and where we get brought. You know, my husband had a job. He had a good job. I loved, I loved his job because I got to stay home, you know, which I still do. Um, and, and another job. Hi, want to go to Dallas? Uh, no, but thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thanks. And he's like, what do you think about Dallas, honey? Well, I don't. <laughs> and guess what? I now live in North Dallas. Um, and, and it happened from March 5th. He got the interview to March 31st. We were closing on our house. So apparently God wants me in Dallas. So it's always going to be taken care of. And whatever this current thing was that I was, you know, ragging to Carlene about, I started laughing and because I could just hear the exasperation in her voice and, you know, just the, the, the long pause silence on the phone when the sponsor's praying. And I, I just busted out laughing. I said, lady, I have no idea what you did to get me <laughs> in like your past life, but it must have really been bad. Um, and she said, well, you know, baby, it was this life. And, and I'm convinced of that. I, I just know that that woman is here for me because she is louder than my head. When that woman talks, my head shuts up. My head is not shut up since I can ever remember. It's always telling me something about somebody or something. Why is he wearing those shoes? That is the stupidest tie I've ever seen. On and on and on. And I can't even, I don't even know what the weather is outside because I am so consumed with what I think you need to be doing. And if you would just do it and get over yourselves and listen to me, all will be well. But then even then you're not doing it right. And, um, so it's always something, you know, and thank God I had all those brothers to boss around. Um, cause I think I would have exploded before I got to a drink. Um, I love those boys today and they're such an important, important part of my story. And, and, um, but one of the things, let's get back to drinking, shall we? Um, one of the things I can tell you about getting drunk is I am not one of the people who know how to maintain and control any kind of respect in any kind of social situation, you know, my husband is a real controlled drinker. That man, he can drink and still stand. And then he'll get home and pass out and puke and do all that stuff. But when he has got to function, he can function, not me. I am going to be drunk to where my nose is numb. I am slobbering and I don't know my name. And that is, there's just no two ways about it. It's the only way I know how to do. I don't know how to do social light drinking or wine tasting or anything. It has just always been to drink, to get drunk. Is there any other way? And that concerned me at an early age because, you know, maybe, Jeanette, you just don't want to drink that much. Or maybe you don't want to drink just Everclear. Try some Everclear and hot chocolate, maybe. You know, all the things, it's not that bad in the ice. I'm from Montana, so it's a skiing kind of thing. It's, you still puke bright red. You know, it doesn't matter what color it is going in. It's how it's coming out. Because I'm going to puke. That's, that's what happens when you poison your body. You puke and then you drink more. And I can remember many times crawling up the side of the mountain. We'd always go drink on the Elkhorn Mountains or Strawberry Mountain or something. And um, being able to see the bonfire and, and just, you know, my hair was jacked up. I kind of went, I did the metal thing, of course. Um, jacked up hair, black eyeliner, and um, got into the, um, you know, shout at the devil. And, uh, <laughs> I did. And I can remember my mother saying to me, God have mercy, July of 1987, what was happening? Um, she said, what is wrong with you? You know, finally she can't take it anymore. What is your problem? They don't know what to do with me anymore. And I screamed at her, I'm evil, you know, cause God, that's how I felt. And nothing can put this fire out anymore. And I'm going crazy. So guess what I did? I started worshiping the devil. Made sense to me. Take your God and go to you know where with him. Um, I'm not interested in that. And I began to do that. And it's very, I always told you it was a, a very dark part of my story. <laughs> um, no pun intended. Uh, quote the raven nevermore. Um, but uh, it, it was very important to, to what began to happen to me because it was about that time I started, you know, breaking all the bottles in my room and cutting on myself and, and going through this whole just, you know, I can't feel unless it's pain. You know, and, I can, and one time I wrote the lyrics to Fade to Black, this Metallica song, in my blood, <laughs> you know, and I like... That was like the thing. And I just remember it was like the night of the living dead. My mother comes down the stairs and I'm covered in blood, my own blood this time. And she just backs away and calls 911. 
I mean, what else do you do when you have a psychotic teenage drunken freak in your house? <laughs> Save my other children. <laughs> that's what you do. And that's what she did. And, and I'm grateful for that. So um, I like the psychiatric unit. Um, that's one of my favorite places to go. Uh, because they have vanilla extract, banana, and rum, and almond extract in there. And um, I'm a, a service person. I'm service-oriented. I'm altruistic in my uh, nature. And so I'm going to bake cookies for y'all. And uh, they cannot figure out down in the kitchen what in the hell's happening to all the banana extract. You know, they just can't because I'm drinking it. Um, I'm drinking anything. I'm drinking rubbing alcohol. I am locked up on ward. It's anything. I'm not thinking about taking the curtains off the hanger yet. And hanging myself. Because if I can get a drink, I'm going to get through this. I'll be all right. Just let me drink. You don't understand. If you just let me drink, I'll be okay. You just don't understand. And um, finally, about that time, um, like I said, I, I stole cars for a living and um, fought professionally, fought for trucks and cops and um, whoever would want to fight me. And um, ended up uh, in treatment the second time out in Tacoma, Washington. And this time, my parents shipped me out of state. And that concerned me. I thought, are they going to let me come home? You know, that's when it was a 28 day treatment center. And I remember him saying, uh, you must complete the first five steps of recovery in order to get out of this treatment center. And I'm like, OK, right on. And then I start reading them their steps and I'm going, huh, that's not happening. That's never happening. <laughs> you know, I'm just not never going to do that. And 56 days later, um, I left that 28 day program. And I uh, didn't do that inventory, and I didn't, and I didn't do that fish step. I sat in front of a counselor um, who brought in a kind priest for me, and we sat there. So, how about those mariners? And we sat there. I thought, you know, really, there's nothing I can tell you. I just drink. I really like to drink. It's okay. It's a family disease. I'm here for my dad. Um, incidentally, my father got sober when I was in treatment the second time, and um, as did my brother. My um, my older brother got sober as well. So I came out of treatment into this pocket of support and network and concern and, you know, rally, 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 rah, rah, rah. You know, just don't let Jeanette blow up today, you know, because that was my parents. I was like old faithful, only untimed. You know, I just was going off at any moment. And. And um, I don't know how to quiet that. It's like, you know, I used to tell my sponsor, it's the nature of the beast to bitch, okay? That's just it. I don't know any other way. I don't know how to criticize. I don't know how to not do all of those things, you know, or not criticize, I should say. And um, so I got out of treatment, and my brother and my dad were sober, and they were going to the Alano Club, and they were members, and they were, like, playing that game you play, Parcheesi or Pinochle or something. And, and my dad's like a member at this thing and he's got his name on a cup and, and then he's serving at district and he's really getting involved. And I'm really, I mean, you're overreacting. Come on now. It's all better now. Let's just hang out go down to Rosa's, grab us some, uh, Cuervo. What's going on? They were kind of in this for the long haul and I got very concerned. I thought, this is, this, this isn't good. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem, <laughs> you know, because I've been drinking with my father since I'm 13 years old. I'm his driver. I learned how to drive drunk in a stolen car, right? So I, I can, I can navigate drunk. I, I know how to drive. And um, my mom starts going to these Al-Anon meetings. And then, you know, I think that part in Beauty and the Beast first, they start thinking and making decisions when Gaston's going on and on about Belle. And that's what happened. My mother became, a, like, a sort of mom. And she started doing what she called tough love. Clean your room. And she'd slam the door. And I'd be like, oh, my God. You know, <laughs> I have to really clean my room now. Um and and what happened is I stumbled into a woman named Anne, and Anne, um, I'll preface this a bit, Anne came into the alternative school where I was at, because I had never been kicked out of Helena High and Capitol High, asked me, please don't come back. Um, so I ended up down an alternative, shotgun and beers at noon. Um, I loved it. It was 920. We were in the bathroom. It was just my kind of people. And Anne came in there as a result of her ninth step. She came in to talk to the principal and to our insight class. I've been in a chemical awareness class since I was in the sixth grade. Um, I wonder why <laughs> I could have taught that class. Um, and Anne came in and told her story. And I thought, I know you. That was my sister's friend. She had a baby and she got a DUI. Now that lady, she's a drunk. That's not me. I have no stretch marks. And I, you know, you already know, I know how to drive drunk. But I couldn't believe what she was talking about. And I couldn't believe that I actually heard. And she said to me, would you like to go to a meeting? I mean, my own parents weren't inviting me to dinner. And I was like, sure. So I was swaying on the porch when she came. A couple tall boys, Tyler and all three. I'm ready for your meeting. Let's go. You know? And, and she took me to a meeting. 
And I sat there, and to this day, I can tell you who read, you know, what was said, all of it. Um, but I cannot describe to you what happened to me there. It was like some kind of terror like I've never known. Because if this sober thing really means, if you're serious about really being sober, like really, you're not doing anything. Speed, weed, coke, smoke, tune, all sucking out, huffing gas, nothing. You're not doing anything. I'm concerned about that because I have to be doing something. Rubber, cement, aerosol, anything. They were serious. I think they were a little serious. We, anything that affects us from the neck up. Well, chocolate? I mean, come on. You people are overreacting. You need to get a hobby. And um, quickly found myself in my second treatment center, like I said, and locked up again for a few weeks. Um, and went into the Helena Club, and there was Anne. Bright, shiny, happy. Hi. Oh, you know, the horror. She wanted to give me whatever it is that she had. I didn't know what it was, but she really wanted to give it to me. And I just thought I'd pass fire, make her happy. Yes, okay, whatever. <laughs> Slow down. You know, she was like four foot eleven, and I felt like I towered over her, you know, but she was just exuberant, enthusiastic, clapping happy drunk. And I could not wait to get rid of her. <laughs> like, leave me alone. I don't want that, you know? Because that was the thing. She took me to a fellowship group. And like all the women there came up to me, gave me their numbers, and ah uh, you know, hugged me. Come on, we'll do coffee. And I'm like, no, we won't. Um, freaking out, freaking out. Couldn't believe it. I thought, oh, my God, you know, this is a fate worse than death. It really is. Because I can't imagine functioning with the lights on in front of any human being without anything in me. I just can't. And so long story short, Anne became my first sponsor. Um, and, and I often tell people I, I didn't know I had a choice. Um, she was willing and able and, you know, an accident happened. It was a mistake. Uh, she took me through the big book Alcoholics Anonymous one page at a time. And of course we opened it up to the first page where there's nothing. You know, this is all you know about anything. You know, anything good. We'll let you know. Turn the page. Alcoholics Anonymous. Turn the page. You know, and it was mundane. I really felt like I was in a wind tunnel, you know, and like she was a throwing stuff at me and a couple things would hit, you know, be on time, put some clothes on, you know, um, God, I just, I, I don't know what, I didn't know she was saving my life. I had no idea. She was about to explain to me the mystery of why it is once I have a drink, I have to have a drunk. Why is it that once I ingest something into my body, it causes a chain of reaction systematic in its process that it is impossible for me to stop or control the amount I'm going to drink, where I'm going to go, or what is going to happen? Because I am having an adverse reaction to that. It's known as an allergy. I have kicked off something in my body that even science has yet to explain. You know, is it the enzymes? Well, is it the lipids? What is it, you know? I'll tell you what, I have a double whammy. I'm Native American and I'm female. So, I, you know, it doesn't matter. It just, it, it is. It is. I have it. Um, and um, like the cussing thing, I've, I've used my right to drink. Um, I abuse that privilege. And um, but I feel it was so necessary. You know, alcohol kept me alive long enough so I could get to you. And, and that's just my experience. It gave me relief and comfort and kept me alive until I crawled into the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous and that cheerleader girl was there. And she would die to know I called her cheerleader. I talked to her today. She is a married mother uh, of two. And um, to a grand chap in AA, and, and they are fine, fine people. And I call her every year on her birthday, her belly button in her sobriety, um, and thank her for saving my life. Because she explained to me, or rather, she, um, the beauty of alcoholism, this is what's wrong with you, kid. Finally, I had a name for it. Finally, I knew. Thank God. And she seemed to know what to do with me. You know, my mom would write her like $65 checks. I want to talk about conferences. She would write a check to Anne. I didn't even get the check. And she'd be like, okay, we're going to the, you know, the spring roundup in Great Falls. I'll have her back Sunday at 6. You know, and then she'd bring me home. I'd get home at 4. She'd say, do your laundry, do the dishes for your mom. I'll pick you up at 7.30 for the meeting. Oh, great. You know, can't wait. And then it was the next thing. Well, it's the attitude of gratitude and $35 for gas and here's money for food. My mom just basically threw me at her and said, do something with her. And they did. Um, they told me where to be, uh, when to be there, and what to be wearing when I got there. And uh, I listened. And that is the thing I know about desperation is that I was in so much pain that even dying didn't seem hopeful anymore. You know, you just know that you're not going to get to die. I overdosed on 102 uh, bare aspirin and a bottle of bourbon. And you know what? I just had uh, black things coming out of my body thanks to the charcoal and uh, pipes up my nose and down my throat and everything poked and, and having the kind, kind doctor, you know, just have tears in his eyes and, and not understand why this 15 year old girl would want to die, you know, and, and that, you know, that 
good man. You know, had he just known. <laughs> Buddy, give me the hot pink ones, okay? Value, second all, dark set, you got anything? I'm your gal. Just give me something and leave me alone and I will be okay. And, you know, I, I am amazed today that I don't do anything. I really don't. I mean, I don't even eat sugar. And and that is for, um, that is by force. <laughs> That's definitely not by choice. Um Again, anything to excess. And, and I remember that woman walking me through my four step and giving me the directions, you know, and, and all the little miracles that began to happen that, you know, we did marathon meetings on Christmas and then the, the next thing you knew it was Easter and they were having some big cookout potluck thing, bring something other than a bag of chips, you know, and I learned how to be responsible. And, and then pretty soon I got a job. I got to bring, I was the girl who got to bring the books into the meeting. I had to carry one of each you know, the A Comes of Age, Dr. Bob the Girl Timers, each one of those books into my home group, set them right in front of the podium, and all the little um, prices were in them with the AA hotline number, and that was my job. That's what I did, and I lost that job. Um, you know, I'm 17 years old. I'm Helen Wills. You know, I forget, oh, they're in my trunk, and oh, ah, shoot, Amanda drove, you know, and I, I get it, I get it, and then finally they'd say, Kurt, do you want to get the books from Jeanette? Ah, I'm unemployed. Well, I guess I'm washing cups. And I washed a lot of cups. I've been promoted and demoted in AA and had, I have consistently been employed. I've never not had a job in Alcoholics Anonymous and, which is why it's so important to have a home group and to have a home and have somewhere I'm accountable and they're dependent on me. But, um, most importantly that I have earned that right and, and I have garnered the privilege. I have served at, you know, district area. I've had an amazing life here that I got to grow up and be a human being. You know, that these little brothers, I started making amends to them, um, Let's see, I got sober when I was 16, and they were 11 and 7. And uh, my, um, so when I was, they were about 5 and 9, I was in a detention center in uh, Helena, because I'm always running away, stealing cars, getting in trouble. So, you know, that the state comes and says, well, we'll take your freedom, since you were demonstrating, you know, the ability to not utilize your freedom. Um, and so I've been, you know, racked up in the Department of Corrections since I was, probably 11 years old and um never saw my mom bring home a strange guy from the bar never saw my mom you know bagging anything on the coffee table it was just inherent it just was you know second nature um a genetic misfiring i don't know it's just what i know how to do and those little boys were so concerned um in the spring of 1985 that the easter bunny was not going to know where i was at that they talked my mom into bringing my easter basket to me and it was this gaudy yellow you know molded paper the peeps and the bunny and the ribbons everything was yellow 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 and my mother of course had a restraining order against her so she couldn't come as if, God, that woman needed to be protected from me. And um, they came walking up, and I remember Brucey had little silver caps on his teeth, and Arnold had no front teeth, and they come walking up there, and, and the um, house parents said, you know, Jeanette, your little brothers are here, and I come to the door and um, just ran a slew of vulgarities at them. I mean, I, I sooner should have spit on them, you know, because I would have caused less harm. And... Um, forgot about that. Did my inventory now call us? I, I don't get sober till three years later. You know that? I mean, that destroy a, a child, break their little heart. And I'm drunk and oblivious for the next three years, three and a half years, as a matter of fact. And, um, I'm driving down Euclid Avenue, um, and, uh, happy, fat and healthy, about five years sober. And Brucey's with me. And now Brucey is not, um, <laughs> you know, five years old. Um, he is 15 years old. And, um, playing a, I think it was middle linebacker then for Helena High, sophomore year. And we went driving by that, that group home, that detention center, and he said, do you remember that yellow Easter basket? Man, I am sucking wind. I feel like someone has just ripped my spine right out of my body, you know, and I'm gripping the steering wheel of my truck, and I'm like, I'm going to crash, I'm going to die, I'm going to go to hell, I'm not going to be able to stay sober. And I said, you know, this harm is not mentioned by me because that is what I've been taught to do. If someone brings up a harm, I say, because I didn't make a direct verbal amends to them because they were young. I started going to flag football games, track events. I started being at school plays. I started being the big sister. And I mean, we're talking front line. I'm not like, you know, some speakers who are pacing on the sidelines and hating every minute of it. Dude, I was in the box. I'm on the field throwing plays, okay? I'm like, we're running a 3-2 defense here. I 
loved being their sister. It was my greatest honor. And to this day, the best good joy that I've had next to being a parent was repairing something in those boys' lives. And um, I, it's, I didn't do it right. It's not going to work. I'm going to drink. And so I just said to him, you know, do you need to tell me how my actions have affected you? What can I do to set that matter straight? And I really regret that that, that is gone and mentioned by me. And uh, I had no right to do that. I mean, I'm just, whoa, whoa, whoa. And um, he gripped. I could see the little whites of his fingernails. And he had like a mouthful of dirt. And he said, it sucked. And my sponsor had just broke her leg skiing, like her ankle or something. So I took Brucey home and I uh, race across town to Carlene's house and I'll never forget it she was on this king bed and um, I go pouncing on the bed man you think I'm dramatic now you should have seen me then her leg goes flying up coming back down and I'm on the bed a puddle I'm gonna die I screwed up it's not gonna work oh my god and I'm crying and I'm crying and she said because she's a cradle Catholic too she goes well it's March Get him a yellow Easter basket. Lame, lame. Oh, my God, woman, can you think of nothing? Like, chop off my left arm and offering. I mean, come on. Something with a little flair, okay? That's not going to work. That's And I get goosebumps on my body today because I said to her, it's not going to work. You don't understand. Now, that woman has had my life in her hands, <laughs> okay? I don't know of anywhere else to go, really. And I'm like, yes, ma'am. Screaming obscenities the whole while in my head. And I went and did what I was told. Got a yellow Easter basket, some yellow grass, yellow peeps, M&Ms. Here you go. Okay? This is pathetic. Okay. Well, it was nice being sober. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> and then the next year, I had to do the same thing. And then the next there. And then I have a kid. And Connor, the, the, Connor doesn't believe in the Easter Bunny. He knows we're the Easter Bunny. And I'm doing it. And I'm doing it. And then I had to move to Seattle. And I'm like, I called my mom one Friday night and said, Mom, I can't find any yellow Easter grass. Oh, my God. You know, so I'm going to, like, get yellow construction paper. And she's like, Jeanette, they know. They know. It'll be okay. Just show up with it. So I did that. Then I got smart. Then I started making these Easter baskets. You're like, you know, three months out, just getting everything ready. And so I would often tell people, if you have no yellow Easter grass, it's because I have all of it. Um, and I really do. I have a Rubbermaid tote. I have an 18-gallon Rubbermaid tote filled with yellow Easter grass. And nobody in my family messes with that Rubbermaid tote. They know <laughs> the grass stays. Every move, my God forbid, my poor husband, he knows, oh, this one's going. And the, the movers pick it up. It's really light. I'm like, just mark it fragile. If you lose that box, you're dead. Um, and I'm really getting into this. I'm grooving on this. This is great. And the whole time, you know, showing up and doing my deal in AA and having babies and making mistakes and getting jobs and changing jobs and all of it, going to college, all of it, it's happening. And then I got to move back to Helena, Montana, or move back to Butte, Montana, rather, in 1998, because what happened to me, and, and I'll tell you what, and, and I'm not saying this lightly, um, after today's tragedy is the fact that um, I'm in no danger of being killed by my spouse today. Um, I'm really not. And for a really long time I was. And if you know my husband, you'll understand because I've been married to two men, a drunk man and a sober man. Um, I like the last one best and it is my first husband and my last husband. Won't be doing this again. Um, I already have sponsorial permission. If this happens again, I even get near a guy. I'm done. Um, this is worn it out. This has been where I was in a relationship with this man, um, for seven years. He was drunk. I tell you, he was a newcomer. See, if you don't make your amends, and do what your sponsor tells you to do, huh, guess what? You get pregnant. Um, that's what happened to me. Um, <laughs> and uh, so this guy, uh, this guy and I build a family and uh, have a kid, and he joins the military. <laughs> oh, is that too close to home? Sorry. You're in the right place. Um, so we, uh, <laughs> we, um, we went to Massachusetts in the Coast Guard. And I sponsored about 36 women out there. And I started a conference, and that's where I got to participate at the district level and area. Um, and um, sponsored a bucket full of women. I didn't know what else to do because I was going crazy because that man was dying right in front of me. And uh, we're uh, in bed one night, and he says to me, we are on a military installation, mind you. He says, you know, I need a chipper shredder. I went, you need a hole in your head. These are the government's trees. Because we're sitting, you know, earlier that evening, we're looking at the trees. We're talking about, you know, God, if that limb was gone, that'd be kind of cool. He's like, you know, I need a chipper shredder. I'm like, Jason, you're talking out. Knock it off. You know, because he's about 15 beers into it. And um, just, just go to bed. Um, and he passed out in peace for many years. And I was a good and faithful wife. And I cleaned it up. And I made sure that it was 
cold porcelain, and I made sure that his his clothes were pressed and ironed, and he was sharp and ready for work, because um, I didn't want to go to prison. Um, and I'm not raising men. Sorry, watched my mom do that. Not interested, buddy. <laughs> this is your job. Um, and he was a good man and a good father and a fabulous provider. Um, so, I, and I stayed. I stayed. My sponsor would say to me, pray, you know, it's for that time when you know that, um, are you strong enough to leave? Are you strong enough to leave? And I would pray that, am I strong enough to leave? Because I just couldn't stay anymore. And Jason, uh, a few months later, said to me, it was, it was the um, middle of April of 1998. He said, you know what? Did you hear about that guy in Florida who killed his wife and got off? And I said, no. Um, he said, yeah, he, he killed her and then he froze her and he put her in a chipper shredder and shot her out over a swamp. And man, my blood went cold because he was blacked out telling me about his chipper shredder. He's pricing chipper shredders. As a matter of fact, that boy was getting ready to order a book, how to kill your spite, your spouse and get away with it. And I knew the end was near. And I'm like, I think you need to reel out from the uh, United States Coast Guard. And we're going to Montana because when it hits the fan, I can do prison in Montana because it's going to be a mercy killing. And and that's it. I'm just going to put him out of his misery if he doesn't get me first. And um, got to uh, got to Montana in July 1988, and that prayer turned into, I'm not strong enough to stay. And I finally got to leave. And I bolted. Sayonara, sucker. Have at it. Knock it out of the park, baby. Whatever you got to do. Drink, drink, drink some more. By this time, I'm like I'm saying, I'm buying two 30-packs at a time, and I'm just like, put it away. I don't know of any other way to get it done, but drink, 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 drink. And if you live, we will get you. That's all I know. And I did what I was told to do. I was in my home group, 68 miles away, one way, every Thursday night. I met with my sponsor every Wednesday night. I was back and forth to Helena. I mean, I was wearing tires out. And uh, when I left him on July 8th of 1999, um, neither one of us knew that from that day to this, he was not going to have a drink or that he was going to be sponsored um, with a man that I watched get sober in my home group or that we were going to go on to spend the last, you know, four years and 11 months together um, liking each other at certain times. We did. We, we didn't. We split rooms. He lived in one room. I lived in the other room. And then you know, it was like I just same thing my mother did. I packed him off to a sponsor and said, let me know when he can date. <laughs> OK, I'll be waiting. Um, but we got through that. We conducted ourselves in a manner that today I'm just thrilled and overwhelmed. With. I can't believe my life. I'm in shock. I stand here before you and it freaks me out that this is me I'm talking about. Because I am the girl who, you know, when I was 14 years old, my, my mother was running for my father again because he was very abusive. And we were living in a, a GMC Yukon at the I-15 rest stop, driving back and forth from Cascade to um, Belt, to, you know, hiding from this man and um, cooking at the rest area. You know, my mother and the, all these children in this vehicle. And um, I just can't believe it. I, you know, so I'm, I host Easter. Okay, mom does Christmas, my sister does Thanksgiving, I do Easter. So I'm home, and or we're in Montana, rather, and um, it was Easter of 1999, and I'm like, okay, party at Manning's, come up to Papa Jim's, we got the ham, we got this, we got that, and I got the baskets. And my brothers, after a while, would be like, all right, where's my basket? And I'd be like, you know, get off, you're not getting it that easy. So, you know, like 97 to 99, I started doing scavenger hunts for him. <laughs> and I'd make him, you know, answer all these questions till they could find him. They'd have to hunt through the house and do all this. Well, as he was, as Arnold was walking up um, the walk, my, my father-in-law lives on Strawberry Mountain, and um, which is endless, beautiful view of the Helena Valley and the eastern front of the Rocky Mountains. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. And um, I was standing there greeting everyone. Hi, hi, come in, come in. I can't wait. And he is, he's walking up the walk, and his wife is with him, and now they have kids. And so I'm making like eight Easter baskets now for both these guys and their kids and their spouses. And, and um, he's got a yellow plant and a yellow paper with a yellow ribbon. And he just walked by me and said, this is for you. And buckets, because I was, I was free. And that transaction was complete. And I cried. My mother was standing there on the porch, and Arnold's wife was standing there, and that boy just kept walking. He just handed it and said, this is for you. And he kept walking. <sighs> what do I owe you for that? That is just one of many, where I got to repair the damage to another one of God's kids, and I came out clean. You know, it's like Clancy said, I fell in the bucket of shit and I found the pony. That's what happened. 
my life. I can't even tell you what it is like to get to live in a world where, you know, the book says it very clear that we've entered the world of the spirit, that I know today why it is I'm in no danger of dying from that boy today. I know that. And I know it does not come cheap. And I know it is not easy. But I can't think of any place I'd rather be, anything I'd rather be doing with a bunch of yahoos I'd rather be doing it with, you know. I am addicted. I am as hooked today as I was, you know, to Jack Daniels, Jim Beam, and Johnny Walker Red. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't work fast as a double shot straight up. But the difference is, is that it lasts. I didn't get a lingering effect. I had to start puking somewhere in the night. And this has lasted me. It has held me in good stead for so many, many years now to where I really, I think, oh, my God, I'm going to have to be here forever. I am a baby. I am a pup. You know that? I have been sober almost half my life. And I can't, I tell, that was not my plan. Hmm. Yes, I, I'm here to learn how to meditate. Hi, here to learn how to be faithful, um, committed wife. Do they teach that here? Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, that was not my deal. I know how to make pot roast today, folks. You know, I was on my way to Vegas to be a stripper. I'm not telling you that I wanted to come to AA and have a clean, decent, useful life. And let's go to Richardson on Thursday night. And I'll tell you why I about flipped out of my skin when, Tim, I'm so delighted that you called and asked me to speak. Because today is the day. Today is the day. It is the anniversary of our organization. This is Dr. Bob's sobriety day. That's what we know as Founders Day. It is a miracle that happened 69 years ago. As, as Clancy says, my life hung in a thread. It was in peril. Which way was it going to go? You know, thank God it went this way. I am in such debt. And I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll talk real brief about this job thing I had. Um, I worked in a corporate America for many years, and I grinded myself into retail America and gave them my blood. I'm not kidding you. And my second born. And um, my God have mercy. And pivotal change. Priority shifted. It was like, you know, make money, be on time, do all of that. Not, you know, read your kid a book, go to the meeting. It was just all a conquer, acquire, achieve, all the stuff that, you know, I think guys are supposed to have. Well, guess what? I'm wired that way too. And my sponsor assures me it's my disease that I'm just not satisfied. Like Mike said, you know, so perfectly with anything, there's not enough of anything. And even ever, if there was, I'd be pissed off that you have some too. And I'd want yours, you know? <laughs> so, so long story short, a week before Christmas, 1998, I lost my job. I was 10 years sober and I got canned. And, um, the uh, lawsuit ended in my favor, of course, but, um, oh, my God, and um, get a job, get a job, get a job, Jeanette, get a job, and I'm like, oh, my God, so I'm at job service, I'm answering ads in the paper, I'm going to go to McDonald's, all right, I'm going to do it, and I answered this obscure, nondescript ad that said, federal job, pays top dollar, you know, send letter resume. I'm like, all right, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It's probably like, you know, who cares? You know, SBA or something, you know, GSA. I don't know. I send off my resume and I get another res uh, another letter, pa I pack it back, fill this out, send this in. I send it back. Then the next packet comes back. And on the letterhead, it reads Federal Bureau of Investigation. And I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> this <laughs> sponsor, uh, because in February of 1989, I was not through um, living as a drug dealer. I was sober. Um, and the uh, FBI in Helen, Montana, in the Ninth District Court, kicked down my door um, when I was five and a half months sober because of my behavior and my actions. And, um, and my father's, of course. And so long story short, I, f I went through it. I filled out all the paperwork. I did all the stuff. I went to all the tests. I got the stuff on me and did all of it. And... Um, and guess what? They hired me. <laughs> and I remember I got the letter on June 10th of 1998, and it said, we are pleased, we are pleased to offer you an appointment with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And I called my sponsor. I'm like, how does that happen? How does that happen? And I'll tell you that uh, through some budget cuts, um, I didn't officially ever get to punch in. What I did instead is I got to go to college, and that is what propelled me into getting an education is because I thought, I don't want an entry-level, you know, security analyst. Dude, I want to, like, be flashing a badge. And so it was enough 
to get me willing to go to class. And I sat in class, and then you know what? Then I end up in Texas, and now I have a little baby at home, and it's just like, all right, well, where do I go next, and what do I do? I have no idea, but if I stay here with you, it is going to be great and good. It will be a most fabulous adventure. So, Rachel, I pray that you hold on. You continue to keep coming back. Wait to listen and hear your story, because that when you do, you will be free. So thanks for inviting me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.